Tuesday video. If you are new here, I am Sonia. Me. And you're tuned into a Christian encouragement video that I do on my channel every other Tuesday. Y'all, we have been pushing through this Strategies for Strength series. I'm super proud of myself because typically I get bored with Transformation Tuesday topics early. Like we're in week, today will be week five in this topic. And I'm like, kind of ready to move forward to something else but i'm like no we're gonna be diligent we are going to finish strong we're gonna do all nine or ten topics in this book period please. so before we get into today's topic as you guys can see by the title i wanted to give a quick shout out to a brand that i have had the privilege of working with this week it is this brand called savage a lifestyle brand first of all can we talk about the packaging can, can we talk about the packaging? So let me tell you a little bit about Savage. Savage is a black-owned, black female-owned lifestyle brand. And she has sent me something that most of us know and love, which is a candle. So let me take this out. So here is the candle that she sent. It says self-love on the front. And the dope thing about this brand is they have affirmation candles. So they all come with a nice little message on the front. She also has uh, water bottles as well that you can reuse. But, you know, candles, candles, black woman luxury, self-care. This is what the ladies are looking for. So she sent me this candle in her fragrance, Sweet Pea. And it smells sweet. It just smells like a nice like lotiony type of smell so i just wanted to give her a shout out i created a little reel of me unboxing this candle so you guys can watch that here and definitely make sure you check her out let me show you her card her name is alexis atkins and again her company is so savage on instagram i'll have the information below as well but yeah so she just sent me a candle and she also sent me this cute little pin that came in the box so yeah I thought this was cute I wanted to take the time to give her a shout out because I'm the type of person who loves candles but I never take the time to buy candles for myself I haven't had a new candle uh in like a year okay so I'm gonna be burning this one boo so thank you, Alexis. I really appreciate the candle. And you guys, make sure you go check her out and support her black business. Okay, y'all. So now it's time to get into the word. Let's get into today's video. And y'all, like I said, we are pushing along in the Strategies for Strength series. So far, we have covered how the enemy attacks your passion, your focus, your identity. Last time was your family, all stemming from our book the fervent book y'all see my notes sticking out of here and all of that a woman's battle plan for serious specific prayer by priscilla shire so we have been going hard in this book you guys keep telling me every time you purchase it again i will always have the link to this book in my description i am not making any money off of you purchasing this book i just really want you to purchase it it's only eight dollars it's only eight dollars so if you want to follow along in the series you still got time because we got five more topics to cover in this book so make sure you do that because today we're going to be talking about how the enemy uses your past against you and when i tell you this topic is so fitting because i was just talking to one of my lovely subscribers over the weekend and she is definitely in a situation where the enemy is trying to use one of her past mistakes, something that she did that she's not proud of um, against her and against her moving forward in her life and believing what she's capable of and, and 
what she deserves. You know what I mean? So we're going to talk about this today. Specifically, how the enemy tries to hold our past over our heads, keeping us from the freedom that God promised us when Jesus died for our sins. Notice I said promised, meaning he's already promised and fulfilled that for us. We all can remember those moments in time, decisions, relationships, etc., that pop into our heads at the most random times, reminding us of who we used to be or maybe who we're still struggling not to be. It's a completely different type of memory. It's the one that immediately brings feelings of disgust, shame, guilt, regret, and condemnation. And that is the easiest way you can recognize when the enemy is is trying to play with you because the memories bring negative feeling most importantly the enemy doesn't know how to do anything but condemn us he doesn't edify us like god so whenever you have a memory of something even when god reminds you of where you used to be in your past it's only to remind you of where you were so that you can appreciate where you are now versus the enemy reminds you of stuff just to make you feel like crap and that's completely different to what god does right so today I want to shed light that, honey, those memories are also an attack from the enemy. Specifically, Priscilla says on page 93 of this chapter that if I were your enemy, I constantly remind you of your past mistakes, poor choices. I want to keep you burdened by shame and guilt in hopes that you'll feel incapacitated by your many failings and see no point in even trying again. I work to convince you that you've had your chance and blown it. That your God may be able to forgive some people for some things, but not you for this. And if that ain't the lie from the pits of hell that the enemy always try to play, that you're not worthy of forgiveness. Well, honey, I'm coming today to tear down that lie. Because I'm tired. Okay? I'm tired. There's not one person on this earth that's not worthy of God's forgiveness. Let's just be clear. There's not one sin that God can't wash away. That's why he's God. Okay? Let's just be very clear. You might not get the same relationships back that you had before. You might not have the same experiences that you had before. But you can be forgiven and you can move forward in where God is placing you now with the people that he's putting in your life now. So we we, we finna get into this. Because I know my girl is not the only one struggling. I suffer with this sometimes too. I mean, we all do. And so I want to make sure that, you know, this video is put out here. So whenever you start to feel like that, you got a reference. You're like, oh, Sonia already did a video about that. Let me go back to it and remind myself of what she said, okay? So let's get into how the enemy uses your past against you. First of all, can we just all agree that the enemy is a nuisance? Like he's so annoying and petty and he just meddles and he's just in the way, always in the, he's like that that gnat at the cookout that you keep shooing away but make it way back and then it'll be flying in your face and sometimes it fly up your nose. He's like that, you know? He's the person who never wants you to grow, never wants to see you heal, and never wants you to be in a relationship with God. And recognize that the enemy is a spirit. So if there's any actual human being that fits that category, what does that mean? That the enemy is working through them? Because they don't want to see you grow. They don't want to see you heal. And they definitely don't want to hear about your relationship with God. Okay, Judas. Okay. Okay. Oftentimes, he succeeds by doing something so simple yet so powerful. He uses your forgiven past to poke holes in your future. And this is a line that I took out of the book on page 94. He uses your forgiven past to poke holes in your future. He uses your forgiven past, meaning that you've already been forgiven by God, to poke holes in where you are now and where you're going. He, at the perfect, most random times, will pop a memory in your mind that can paralyze your spiritual growth if 
you allow it. The enemy is very strategic. And 1 Peter 5, 8 says that the enemy walks around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour, meaning he's always looking for a perfect time to mess with you. He always wants to smoke. He always got time. He always sells out and got time and ready. And what's more convenient than your mind? Our minds are like houses, but full of locked doors. And for many believers, we like to believe that God holds the keys to all these locked doors of our mental growth, mental health, and opportunities in our life in general. But for most of us, God has to continuously remind us that it's us who actually holds those keys, but God is the one who guides us to which door to open and when. Well, the enemy is like a home burglar that has nothing else to do but try to break in your house. That's all he do day and night. That's his goal, that's his only purpose, okay? When he himself can't physically unlock the door, because you guys know that the enemy can only get in if you allow him to. So when he himself, can't physically unlock the door. He manipulates you to do it yourself, just like he did with Adam and Eve in the garden and just like he tried to tempt Jesus for 40 days and 40 nights when God, when Jesus was fasting. And sometimes there's nothing explosive happening externally in our lives. Like externally, things are going good, but it's the internal war that breaks your spirit down. So I'm on page 94 and I want to read a couple of paragraphs that Priscilla has. It says he, which is the enemy, carefully archives footage from our history so he can pull from those files and remind us what our days of defeat, sin, and failure look like. You've seen them, same as I have, a million times. If your life is anything like mine, I'd imagine he's turned every room in the house into a screening room at one time or another popping one of his old favorites into the player for his amusement and for our humiliation and embarrassment. It's a painful thing to watch, even in reruns, especially in reruns, because every time he cues it up again, it's with the fresh intent of mocking and maligning us, making us feel as unforgiving and as unforgivable as possible. And then even pointing the finger at other people who are more to blame and more at fault than we should ever consider ourselves to be. If he can't make us feel judged, he'll try to turn us into judges, right? This person did, I remember when that person did, I'm judging them because I remember when that person treated me wrong. Okay, guilty. I'm guilty of that. So it's quite a show he puts on and quite depressing, mostly because as he loves to remind us, we're the ones who give him so much material to work with. Girl, listen, okay? Again, it's the, the consistent fact that the enemy can only do what we allow. And that's not to say that we have control over everything that the enemy does, but those thoughts are going to come, right? They, they come. We don't have control over the thoughts that just randomly pop up into our heads, but you do have control over whether or not you dwell on them. So like, for instance, when she was talking about the part where, okay, if he can't get us to feel bad, then we start judging other people who are part of these bad memories. When I think about what happened with my dad's estate in that story that a lot of you guys know, if you haven't watched that, I'll link those two videos below. Even now, I have to make sure I stop myself before I let those thoughts trickle on because I can work myself up all over again about a situation that I am saying that I have forgiven, right? Especially when you're like, I'm, I done grown past that. That don't even bother me no more. Okay, but then as soon as you think about it, you're going on a, on a whole tangent in your mind or a venting session about how this person did you wrong. You just let the enemy in your house right in. Because if you over it, right, you ain't, I ain't worried about it no more. That is beneath me. It's above me now. It's above me. Is it above you talking about it for 30 minutes though? Is it over, is it above you rambling about it again for 30 minutes? Check the doors in your house, boo. 
check the doors in your house okay so this is what dwelling in your past affects in your life this is how dwelling in your past affects you so the enemy loves to take the joy out of growth this is one of the most um i think slyest ways that he gets out of us because we don't even realize that we have given up our joy about something he does this so effortlessly. And I can remember times when I used to be in these horrible relationships, right? Yet there were so many good things going on in my life. So I was graduating from college. I got accepted into my master's program. I graduated with my master's degree, getting my first apartment, getting my first like official job. But because I was in these terrible relationships and I was focused on this trash dude, I couldn't really appreciate what God was doing for me at the time in my life. And I really couldn't celebrate how I wanted to celebrate because I was more concerned about who didn't show up for me, who wasn't there to emotionally support versus who was and what was good, what good was going on in my life. There are seasons and times in my life that seem to fly by and I have very little positive memories about them because I wasn't focused on the right thing. So I wasn't celebrating my success during those times. That is what the enemy does with your past. He uses it in the same way. In moments where you've grown spiritually or you're trying to grow, he throws in a harmful memory that yanks away the excitement of the steps you're taking to be a better you. And it puts a bitter, somber taste in your mouth when you think about who you were years ago, months ago, or even days ago. Okay, so he will definitely yank the joy right out of your growth. The second thing that he does is he uses shame and guilt to keep us from learning from our past. So let's look at some paragraphs on page 95 in the fervent book. But in the hands of the enemy is always a horror film. You run from it, you hide from it, you keep living and reliving it over and over again with no resolution, just a persistent dread and heartache, never out of range from his cackling, accusing reappearance, always at risk of having it jump up and scare us just when we thought we and God had finally settled it for good. And that's how, instead of living with assurance, we become bombarded with shame. Instead of celebrating God's grace, we feel undercut by continual guilt over the same old things. Instead of experiencing the ongoing residual blessings of being regenerated by his spirit, all things being new, we're caught in the spin cycle of ceaseless regret, okay? So instead of turning that regret into a teachable testimony, we hide from it. We tuck it away and we get embarrassed about it. And so it just festers like mold in our hearts and in our mind. And even though we're putting it away, in a strange sense, we're actually holding on to it. Because sweeping things under the rug doesn't get rid of a problem. It just covers the problem up. The problem is still in your house. You're just using your living room rug to cover it up. So it hasn't gone anywhere. You're stepping on it every day. You're sitting on it every day. It's just covered up with that rug. You know what I mean? And I feel like that is the main thing that keeps people stuck in their past and, and stuck in this kind of weird transition from your past, from who you were to who you are now to who you're trying to be in the future. And I also understand that there are a lot of traumatic things that happen to people. So I'm by no means just saying that, oh, you should, you should just not care about your past at all. No, but what I always promote is you doing the necessary steps to really heal, whether that's therapy or, you know, whatever it is that you need to do for yourself. Um, even if you have to take like anxiety or depression medication, whatever you need to do, having that fight back against the enemy to say, I will not stay here because shame and guilt will make you sick. That will bring on depression. It will bring on a stagnant, low living life. And that's not what God calls you for. Not at all. And the third thing that I noticed that the enemy does is he prompts you to suffer in silence. I cannot stand this because I know when he does it and I've been able to identify in my life the areas that he does this. Most of the time we feel so guilty and ashamed of something that we just won't talk about it and we won't even pray about it sometimes. 
The enemy is so good at convincing us that we're alone. Don't nobody understand what I'm going through. I'm so misunderstood. Nobody's situation is like mine. Nobody can relate. And here's the, here's the big lie. Here's the big lie that he convinces us to do. That you've done the absolute worst thing in the world and there's no one, not even God, who can help you with this. It's this notion of, I deserve to feel this way because I made the mistake, because I messed up. Baby, if you don't get that lie from the pits of hell about your mind and about your voice, about your commentary, about your vocabulary, boo, what? Who? Honey, let, let's skip on to page 100 because I had to skip down for this because she says something so good about this. On page 100, she says, the devil wants you to think that your past is worse than everybody else's. Or he wants to suggest to you, listen to this, he wants to suggest to you that given your religious background, what you profess to be in public, your past sins, though perhaps not the shocking or scandalous type, still disqualifies you from parading around all Christian life. So he he tries to convince you that the sin that you do, that you've done disqualifies you of being a Christian. And I've definitely had those moments where I've acted out of anger and acted out of rage where I'm like, "Oh my god, like that doesn't represent God. I'm not representing God well." And it's it's not untrue because you know, we do things that are outside of God's will and his nature. However, that doesn't disqualify me from God's love. Nobody can come and take my Christian card away. You would literally have to unkill Jesus to do that. It's not going to happen. So then she goes to say, look, here's the truth. There's not one of us, not one, who can't stare back into our past and wish a hundred times that we've done things differently, right? And the reason it's only a hundred today is, is probably because our memory isn't what it used to be. And Chad, I thank God that I done forgot a lot of things that I used to do, Okay. Not to mention, despite our best efforts, we keep feeding our enemy new clips of failure to choose from and compile. And as soon as they fade into the past, he fires up the projector again and invites himself over for popcorn to make sure we're seeing how bad it is and how bad we are. And listen, this is why I'm so transparent about my story. You guys have, I have countless of videos on my, on my channel and Transformation Tuesday videos, just being very transparent about my past and about my story. And it's not always easy, but it's so freeing. It's so freeing. Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb, which is Jesus, and by the word of their testimony. The enemy wants you silent and shame, but God wants you boastful about your past so that you can show other people where you came from and how it can change with God. And so that's why I get on camera every other Tuesday now. And I give you guys a background story about where I used to be. And, and used to be could have been yesterday. It could have been last week. You know what I mean? I don't, I'm still very much so my personality. So I could still get myself into some situations sometimes. And again, that doesn't take my Christian card away. There's things I have to learn. There's things that I'm definitely convicted about that I have to change. But then I can get on camera and I can use it as a testimony to help you guys, right? And that doesn't mean that everybody is going to be a minister. But what I'm saying is don't think that you're alone. You all tell me so much how much you relate to something that I've said or something that I've been through. So please believe there's somebody out there who relates to your situation as well. The enemy will make you think that nobody understands. But guess who understands? Because he know everything. God. So even if I don't understand, even if your best friend, your parents, your, your man, your kid, whoever, if they don't understand, we have a God who understands Jesus was tempted in every way in his 33 years on earth. He gets it. So if you can't talk to anybody else, talk to God, boo. So speaking of that, I just want to remind you that God has already freed you. You just have to accept the deliverance from your past. 
You just have to accept God's deliverance from your past and release that shame and guilt and know you've been forgiven. I saw a video one time that was kind of hard to digest at the time because I was going through all that stuff with uh, my dad's estate. And there was a, a, I don't know if she was a pastor or a minister, but there was a lady on there speaking about the fact that people don't actually owe other people an apology, right? She talked about how it's, it's in the Bible that we're to repent to God. We're to repent for the sins that we've done to God and how we can't get so caught up on getting apologies and closure from other people because that person moves on with their life, right? And we're the ones who get stuck in this past situation waiting on them to get it. But as long as we have had conversation, this coming to Jesus moment where you know, giving that over to God, the scripture says, cast your cares onto him. That right there is closure. It's freedom. And that's not to say that you walk around here not, not taking accountability and not apologizing to people, okay? When you be acting up. That's not what I mean. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I feel like sometimes we hold on so much to this idea of getting closure and this idea of, I want to hear an explanation for what you did to me. And God is like, can I just be enough? Can, can your relationship with me be enough to free you? Can I be your closure? Can I be that for you? So look, okay, let's be clear. Jesus dying on the cross did not just get the sins of people in that time forgiven. He paid in advance and in full for your sins too, yours and mine. All these things that you have done and will do, Jesus said, yeah, I'm gonna pay for that. I'm gonna pay for it in advance because I know she's gonna cut up. But the problem is we've become so desensitized to the powerful sacrifice that Jesus gave us 2,000 years ago. We believe in Jesus. We know what he's done. We know that he died on the cross. We recite the scriptures. We sing the songs, right? But do we truly believe in it for ourselves? For you as a personal being, for your heart, for your sins? Do you truly believe that for you? Because if we did, the weapons of shame, condemnation, and, a, and guilt cannot prosper. And the enemy knows that. He knows that you believe in deliverance for certain areas of your life. And he knows that certain areas of your life, you like, eh? <laughs> like, I believe, yes, God delivered me from my sins, from smoking weed. Praise God. But this area over here, I don't, I don't, I don't quite know about that. <laughs> but God says all, not some, not the ones that are easier to accept, but all of our sins are washed away. He remembers them no more for his sake. Remember, God doesn't tell us we have to be perfect to be loved or accepted by him. He says that we, in our jacked up selves, the person that we currently are today, okay, just have to love him with all of our hearts, mind, and soul. That's the first and greatest commandment. That's it. No prerequisites or character changes needed to be loved by God. God's love is what gradually changes you over time as you progress in relationship with him. The goal is not to be perfect people, but progressing people. So let me close by reading a couple of the passages on page 98 and 99. First, God does not live in the past because God, your God, exists outside of time. To him, the past that so haunts and hamstrings you, the past that so ruffles and frustrates you, is not in the past at all. In prayer, you are alone with the God who sees you only as you are and has always been since the beautiful moment when he placed you on this earth and placed you in faith in him, holy, righteous, and blameless, past, present, and future in his sight. He forgives your guilt, removes your shame, and declares his work and establish all time fact. Period. Prayer does a complete runaround of Satan's pitiful accusations, ushering us into an internal realm with God where the past doesn't even compute. It don't even it don't even touch you, boo. You dodging it like little Kim out here, okay? 
And second, we only live by God's grace anyway. All that stuff Satan tries to hang over our head, those forgiven feelings of ours are no longer reasons for shame, but are now monuments to the totally amazing grace of God. I mean, just look at what he's able to forgive. This and that, all those things. Yes, even that. Isn't God incredible that he could forgive even that, whatever that is to you? The glory our God receives and will eternally receive from having saved our souls doesn't come from all the good stuff that we've done, right? We worship God because we know we was out here acting a fool. That's why I be getting so emotional and turned up because I know where I've come from and some of the things that still come out of my mouth today. I ain't even gonna hold you, okay? His glory comes from creating people of purity and spiritual passion who once did things like that, whatever that is. So talk it up, devil. You can say what you want to say, Pooh. She goes on to quote Ephesians 3.18 because as high as you choose to ratchet it up, you're only showing off the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ has towards me. So Satan, yes, you can be the accuser of the brethren all you want, but he can't change what the cross has done to throw all his accusations out of court. Every last one of them on an undeniably divine technicality. Honey, when Jesus died on the cross, that just, whatever you got to say, enemy, it's just null and void at this point. Pack it up. It's over with, okay? So she goes on on page 101 to talk about how you can pray for freedom for these feelings that you feel about your past. So the first thing she says is to, of course, praise. Thank God for completely forgiving and cleansing you and changing you. Repentance. See the foolishness of anything that perpetrates old sin patterns and by his spirit walk away. That is what's going to keep you consistent in your freedom. Now, you can't be out here still dibbling, dabbling in your sin and then wondering why you feel like crap about it. Sometimes you're feeling convicted. Sometimes it's not even like, girl, look, okay? Identify anything in your life that's not of God and turn from that, okay? Asking. Ask for freedom. Ask to be released. Ask for the... the Ask for the ability to deflect the lies and embrace truth. There are certain thoughts that will come up in my head where I literally will say to myself, no, that's not true. That's not who you are. That's not what that means. And I have created this habit over time of even when the thought, because the thoughts are going to come. But when the thoughts pop up into my head and I, and you know, I recognize what I'm doing and I recognize that I'm going down this path, I tell myself, no, Sonia, no. Meaning we're not accepting that thought as truth. I'm not letting that impact me. We're not going down this emotional roller coaster. Pull yourself together, okay? And think, think other ways. Think of this another way. And that's the biggest thing that I have been doing. Telling those thoughts, no. Sometimes you have to tell your mind, no, we're not doing that. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for this emotional breakdown. I don't have time. So it's, it's a no for me, sis. Zero stars would not recommend. Okay? And the last thing that she says is to say yes. Because you, by his resurrection power, can now walk in a new way of life. It is the acceptance of his grace and of his forgiveness for your life, okay? So you guys, I hope you enjoyed this video about how the enemy will attack your past and how to free yourself from the things that you have done in your past. God has already forgiven you, sis. Let's move forward. Move forward in a new light. Move forward in new relationships that don't remind you of your past all the time. Move forward with new people. Move forward with new things. God says that when you come into him, he makes all things new. So accept that newness. Accept that new you, that new mindset, and move forward. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes for prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much for your sacrifice for us. Thank you so much for dying on the cross and paying the price that we could never pay for our sins, Lord God. 
I want to thank you so much, Lord God, that you're so good that you call even, even the filthiest of us clean and righteous in your sight. Lord, thank you for forgiving us for the things that we've done years ago, months ago, days ago, or even hours ago, for the things that we will do even after we get done watching this video, Lord God. I thank you that you tell us that even with all the things that we've done, we can still live a life of freedom. We can still live a blessed life, an abundant life, a life full of joy and happiness and peace, Lord God. I rebuke the enemy right now that tries to steal that away from us, Lord God. You tell us that you will replace everything that the locust has have eaten and you will protect us lord god so create this hedge of protection around us right now around our minds and around our hearts lord god release us all from any shame and guilt lord that we are holding on to for a past situation or a past life that we no longer can afford to allow to control our lives lord god help us to step into our future free Lord God, put us around the right people. Bring us the right friends, Lord God. Bless us with heavenly help in our lives, Lord God, that knows how to be a good friend to us inside and out, that knows how to be a good support system, that lifts us up, not reminds us of all the things that we used to do, Lord God. And so I just ask, Father God, that you teach us how to speak to ourselves better, how to deflect and remove those thoughts from our minds, and how to speak to you about the things that the enemy tries to convince us that you don't want to hear about. Lord, You, we know that you love hearing from us, Lord God. And so I just ask that you give us the strength to pray about the things that we are ashamed of, pray about the things we feel guilty about, Lord God, and really step into that freedom. It is in your mighty matchless name that I do pray, Lord God. Chain breaker. I love you so much. And amen. All right, y'all. All right, y'all. All right, y'all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this video so much. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for 12 plus K. Make sure you guys are following me on Instagram at simply sign underscore M. Stay tuned for ghetto Bible studies that take place specifically on Instagram live. And I will see you guys in my next video. I will see you guys in my next video. I will see you guys in my next video. Love you. Bye.